Then six days before the Passover, oh, and then, I'm sorry, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now this was in the house there at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. There was another occasion similar to this in the house of Simon the Pharisee. Simon was a common name. But this is in the house of Simon the leper and <clears throat> Lazarus, who had been dead, who the Lord raised, he's there. And, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus and all the other brethren that are there, they're just overjoyed at what Christ had done for them in saving them by grace. And so they wanted to show their gratitude for Christ, and they made him a supper. They made him a supper. It wasn't for Lazarus. This was for Christ. They made him a supper. That house was full of joy. You can just picture, we've had our gatherings, and, and everybody's talking and, and fellowshipping with one another, and you can just picture that house full of brethren, and they're having a, a time of rejoicing, and they're sit, seated around the table, and, and Christ is speaking, and they're just listening to him, and they're rejoicing in him. Time of great rejoicing. First of all, I want you to think about this. It's the great blessing of Christ to come to our town. That's a great blessing. He, he, it says there that Lord Jesus came to Bethany. This is a great blessing when Christ comes to your town. There were a lot of towns, a lot of cities that our Lord did not go to. He passed by when he walked this earth. But our Lord came to Bethany. They, they were blessed. The Lord came to their town. And not only that, there were a lot of houses in Bethany that our Lord didn't go to. But he went to this house came to this particular house, and that was the house that was blessed because he came there. And there were some people in that house that he didn't come to. But the ones that were blessed were the ones he came to in saving grace and revealed himself in. They were blessed. He came to this town. He came to this house. He came to his particular people in this house because he everlastingly loves his own. You know, the Lord forbid Paul to preach in certain places. Sent him to other places and forbid him to preach in certain places. It says over in Acts 16, 6, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. God forbid them. And after they were come to Mysia, they thought they'd go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they saw a vision, appeared to Paul, and a man of Macedonia prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And then he gathered assuredly, the Lord had sent them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. So he went there. They went there. The Lord directed Paul to Philippi. Then he directed him to a place by the river. And then there, among those people at the river, the Lord called out his particular child, Lydia, and revealed himself in her and gave her faith in Christ. Then after that, the Lord had Paul arrested for preaching the gospel in Philippi, put him in prison. And now that would have appeared that the Lord's purpose was frustrated and Paul's mission was, was, was compromised because he got thrown in prison. No, the Lord put him there because he had an elect child who was the jailer. And Paul preached the gospel to him and to all in his house. And God called out that jailer and many in his house. And that 
That was the Lord establishing the church at Philippi, the Philippian church. That's how he did it. So brethren, consider it a great, great lesson when the Lord comes to your town, to your house, to you in particular. He passes by many. He passes by many. He only comes to those he chose in eternity, those he everlastingly loved. It's a great, great blessing. Never take it for granted. There's a, there is a eternity of blessings in this one statement. Then the Lord Jesus came to Bethany. A, there's an eternity of blessing in that. Then secondly, behold the Lord's love for his people by considering the time of this, the time of this supper. It says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Now the Lord is all-knowing God. He knows everything. And he knew everything that was transpiring around him. He ordained it. He's God. He knew everything that was happening. And this was a dangerous, 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 tumultuous time. This was a dangerous time. Christ raising Lazarus was the last straw for the Pharisees. We saw last time, they, at the time this was going on during this week, they were counseling together, either right before this or right after. It's kind of hard to tell, but I think it probably was right after this that they actually counseled together. But they, they were prepared to kill the Lord Jesus at this time, and anybody associated with him. Anybody associated with him? They want to kill Lazarus because the Lord raised him from the dead. And people were believing on him. But our Lord came to this supper at this time. He came there at this time. And this town of Bethany is, is fairly close to Jerusalem where the Pharisees were. And he came there. And then think about this. The Lord knew Judas was in that house. Judas was the one who was going to betray him. In fact, it's at this house, when he rebuked Judas, that it says, one of the Gospels says, then Judas went out, right after this supper right here, and went and, and asked the Pharisee, what will you pay me to betray him to you? And the Lord knew he was there. Now, the Lord didn't come to Judas in saving grace, because he was not his own. But Judas didn't stop the Lord from coming there to his elect at that supper. Think about that. Think about this. The Lord knew in a few days, just a few days, he would be arrested. It's six days from the Passover. And, it just, and I don't know in that week's when he came to this supper. It doesn't, say, it doesn't mean it was the sixth day he came there, but somewhere right around in there, in that week, he came to this house for this supper. And he knows at the end of that week, he's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten, stripped, beaten, nailed to a cross. And he knows this. He knows he's going to bear the sin of his people. He's going to bear the wrath of God and be forsaken of God on the cross. And think about this. Think about this. He knows that some of those sinners in that house are the ones for whose crimes he will suffer all of that. If you knew people out of supper were the people in just a few days, you're going to be arrested for their crimes and thrown in prison and executed for their crimes? Could you go to that feast rejoicing? You see the love of Christ in that? He loved them. He was going to the cross for them. In fact, he went to this house for them. He went there to encourage them. He went there to comfort them. He didn't go there sullen. He didn't go there thinking about what he was facing. He went there rejoicing with them that rejoice. He went there to comfort them. He went there to encourage them. They made this supper for him. And he went there for them. That gives a greater meaning to Romans 8. Look, look back over there with me, and I want, you to, I want you to read this, and I don't think I've ever read it this way, thought of it this way, but knowing Christ went to that supper, 
As you see the great love of our Lord, knowing he's going he's gonna to bear their sin and lay down his life for them. He goes there rejoicing, comforting them, sitting at that table, feasting with them. Now read this verse right here and read it from Christ's point of view. Read it considering Christ knowing what he was about to suffer for his people. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He knew he was about to face all of that. Did that stop him from going to that supper? Not at all. Look at verse 38. I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels no principalities, no powers. There were a lot of principalities and powers. There was Pharisees and the devil working, all of them trying to get him to forsake his people. That didn't make him stop loving them. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature should be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see his love for his people? I always read that thinking about things we go through because, you know, we're as lambs for the slaughter. But think about it from Christ's point of view. None of that that he faced made him turn from loving his own. He went to that feast. And, and he still does it to this day, brethren. The love of Christ for his people, those that he everlastingly loved, he never ceases loving. He loves his own. He loves them to the end. And, and he chose us by grace, and therefore his love knows no shadow of turning. Not any. Later we're going to see this. John 13, 1 says that night he was betrayed. The very night he's betrayed. This was six days before the Passover, or somewhere thereabouts. But the very night he was betrayed, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Loved them to the end. I pray that the Lord would make us to know, like Paul said, to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see his love? You see his great love? He came, to, he came to that supper six days or less from suffering the cross. He came there. Then notice this. We see how the love of Christ toward his people constrained his people to love him. It says here, they made him a supper. Now, just like it was dangerous for him, this was a dangerous, dangerous time for them too. We've been watching the news. You've seen these bombs going off in Ukraine and Russia entering into Ukraine and the bombs falling. And This would be like a group of believers in Ukraine assembling together to worship the Lord, have a supper together with bombs falling all around them. That, that's what the time was like that they came. Actually, it was more dangerous than that. More dangerous than that. And they made this supper for the Lord. Why did they do that? What made them do that? Well, the Lord provided everything for them like he does all his people. And they knew this. They knew it. Christ raises his people from the dead spiritually in regeneration just like he raised Lazarus from the dead. And when he does, he gives you a new heart of faith and love. And there sat Lazarus at the table communing with the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you just, you've had these dinners where you sit around the table and you just, after you eat, you sit there and you talk about Christ and what he's accomplished and what he's done and he was sitting there with Christ at the table. I can hear the Lord speaking about what he was doing for his people and what he had done for Lazarus. And I can hear Lazarus saying, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Tell him about how you spoke and just by your voice brought me out of the grave. Tell him about that. Giving him all the glory. All the glory. 
We have to be born from above. The new birth is all of the Lord. It's all of his grace. And we have to be born of him and given, given repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ so that we have communion, fellowship with Christ. That's when the love of Christ constrains us. And they made this supper because Christ makes his people know that he's healed us personally, like he does all his elect. He healed us personally. He makes us know this. Our Lord Jesus Christ had told him repeatedly he's going to that cross. And he's going to be betrayed, and he's going to suffer, and he's going to die. And he's, and he's going there to bear the sin of his people, to put away our sin. And that's what he did. He justified us from all our sin. He made us the righteousness of God in him. I know without a doubt that we just don't get what that means. <sighs> the, not just righteous, he made us the righteousness of God in him. That's what it takes to be accepted of God. And he came and he made you know it. He made you know he did it. And he gave you faith to believe him and to trust him. And what does that make you do? Makes you love him. Makes you love his people. Mary there is a picture of somebody worshiping the Lord. She came with this, she saw his precious blood. She, she knew something of his precious blood. She knew something of the unsearchable riches of Christ. How'd she know that? Because she was always at his feet three times. Three times we read. Another time at, when they were at Martha's house, she was seated at his feet listening to him. When she came to him at Lazarus' tomb, you know what she did? She ran and fell down at his feet. You know where she comes to in this house? She comes to his feet. <laughs> and she takes up, she heard, she knew something of what he'd done. And she took this box of, this alabaster box of ointment, and she broke it like he had broken her heart, like he had given her a heart of flesh. And she poured out that costly ointment. That ointment cost a year's wages think about that think of taking a year of your salary and spending it in the cause of Christ and when a believer does this it doesn't seem like a sacrifice to the believer it's not enough because you see you can't put a price on Christ's precious blood can't put a price on his blood. Can you put a price on eternal life? Can you put a price on having no sin before God? You can't put a price on that. <laughs> what is there? What is there that we can sacrifice to show our gratitude to Him? She came and broke open, and she didn't just take. Normally, it was a custom to take a little ointment, a little of this. Uh, ointment and put it on the head or, or, and put it on the feet and to refresh the guest. She didn't do that. She poured it out on him. He's the guest of honor. He's the one that they're honoring with his sub. She goes and pours it out on him. I know we don't see that and understand that custom in our land. And we probably wouldn't think that was necessarily a complimentary thing if somebody poured out this ointment on us while we're sitting at a table, at the dinner table. But it was, it, and he knew it was, and he saw it that way. And I don't know whether she knew she was anointing him for burial. I think she probably knew something of it because she sat at his feet all the time. But our Lord said to her in front of them all, she did this to anoint my body for the burial. Is that not like the works that we do in for Christ. You do works for Christ often that you don't realize you're doing or even have an understanding of exactly why you did it or what good it's going to do only to, for him later just like he after she did this he spoke and said she did this for my anoint my body for burial. It couldn't be done after he died because he was resurrected. He wasn't going to stay in the grave. There wasn't any point to anoint him after that. She did this beforehand, showing he is the Messiah. He is the anointed of the Lord. But how often is it that after the fact, after you've done something, then the Lord makes you know more clearly why you did it, how he was glorified in it, makes you know things about it you didn't even see in it. But he knew. He knew. 
And that's what she saw, how he poured out grace and abundance on her. And she poured this out on him. She poured it out on him. That's what love for Christ will make you do. She bowed to his feet. She took her hair, the glory of a woman. She took her hair, let it down in public, which was not a custom for a Jewish woman to let her hair down in public, let it down in public, bowed down to his feet, and, and dried his feet with her hair. That's the glory of a woman, Scripture said. What's she doing? What's that a picture of? That's a picture of a believer coming and bowing at Christ's feet and renouncing any glory of to ourselves and giving all the glory to Christ. He did it all. He did it all. That's what she did. And then they made this supper for him in gratitude for him for continuing to teach his people. For, for, for raising us from the dead and giving us communion with him, for laying down his life and pouring out his precious blood. She came there and poured that ointment out. Lazarus sat at the table communion with him. She came and poured out that ointment. And then we also try to, we want to make a supper for him to show our gratitude to him for continuing to teach us, for gently, mercifully reproving us and admonishing us and keeping us looking to him. They all made this supper, but it says, and Martha served. And Martha served. Some speak harshly about of Martha because on another occasion the Lord reproved her. But he didn't reprove her for serving. He didn't reprove her for serving. The Lord didn't, didn't reprove her for that. He reproved her for distracting Mary from Christ by her serving and for her being distracted from Christ by her serving. He reproved her for wanting to force Mary to serve. He reproved her for wanting to turn Mary from Christ. That's why he reproved her. But he didn't reprove her here. <laughs> he didn't reprove her at this feast. He didn't reprove her. To, why not? Because her heart is set on Christ. That's why. Her heart's set on Christ. She had just experienced again his mercy to her when she saw all her unbelief at, the, at Lazarus' tomb and how merciful and gracious and kind and gentle he was to her at that time. She just experienced it all over again. Just like she did back there at her house when she was cumbered about serving and he gently reproved her there. And she experienced it again. And his mercy, his mercy, his mercy, his mercy. That's what she experienced. And her heart set on Christ. She just saw him raise her brother. She just saw him raise her brother. And she's gladly serving with her heart set on the Lord. You know what she's doing? Lazarus. Don't get up, don't get up. I want you to be able to, don't, you keep your heart set on Christ's communion with him. I'll get you whatever you need. <laughs> Mary, you keep, stay at his feet this time. Don't, don't come and help me. I'll get you whatever you need so you can keep communion looking to Christ. That's what God commands. That's what Christ commands. That, this thing of saying, why don't you reprove her and tell her to help serve like I'm serving. That's the pharisaical means and methods and, and motives that Christ saves us from. But here, it's what he saves us to. Helping brethren look to Christ only. And that's what she was doing here. Serving heartily to the Lord and helping everybody there keep their eye on Christ. You see there, you see Lazarus sitting there communing with the Lord. That's why they want to make him a supper. He'd raised him from the dead. You see Mary pouring this ointment out on him, worshiping him, worshiping him. That's why they made this supper for him. They wanted to worship him for redeeming him and pouring out his precious blood and, and pouring out the balm of Gilead and making us whole. That's why they wanted to make this supper. And they want to make this supper for him and serve him 
for being merciful to us when our service is so pitiful and so pharisaical and so full of unbelief and trying to make others do what we think they ought to do. He comes and turns you back to him and reminds you of his mercy, his mercy in serving you and laying down his life for you and continuing to serve you by turning you to him. And it makes you serve him with your heart set on him. Well, thank God for the Lord's Marthas. Each time we have a meal in this place, you ladies serve. And that doesn't go unnoticed. That doesn't go unnoticed. We see it. The Lord knows it. And we thank you. Thank you is a good thing to, to do. Always thank you, brethren. And Christ provides everything we have so we can make him a supper. That's another reason, they, something else they knew. He provided everything they had to make this supper. He provided the house. He gave them the provisions they needed to, for the food and everything. It's his world he created. He grew everything that they eat in there. Provided it all and gave them the heart to give it and make this supper for him. And they knew Christ and these great blessings we have from him. They had experienced his power and his grace. And they knew it. They knew him. They knew his blessings more at this time than they had known it since they first met him. Don't you know him more today than you've known him since you first met him? And they were constrained by his love for them. And they took the things he provided in the midst of this tumultuous time. And this dangerous time. They made this supper for him to honor him. Why? Because his power and grace making you see him and what he's done for you will settle your heart on him to believe him and assemble with his people and continue loving one another when the bombs are going off all around you. And where Christ has produced that heart, Christ promises to come and sup with us just like he did with them that day. He's promised that. Listen to this from Revelation 3.20. This is Christ speaking. Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. It's sad what will worshipers have done to that verse. They set up, stand up, and they beg sinners, and you know, Christ has done everything he can. Now exercise your will and open the door and let him in. He's standing on the outside knocking. He just wants to come in so badly. Now you picture that day at that house. Christ walks up to the door. Do you reckon there was one sinner in that house who had experienced his grace and his power who was unwilling to open that door? Reckon there was one of them in there. I picture them trying to crawl over themselves to be the one to get to the door and open it up and let him in. And I can tell you something else. When they opened the door and let him in, whoever opened the door didn't turn around and say, y'all, look at me, I opened the door. No, they, every eye and every heart was on their Redeemer. Every one of them. But Christ promises... He promises to honor those who honor him just like he did that day in Bethany. Look down at verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. That's one way he honored them. He came to the feast. But here's another way he honored them. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now unbelief, self-righteousness, will worshipers, they wanted to kill not only Christ, they want to kill Lazarus too. Why? Because other folks were believing on Christ because of what Christ had worked in Lazarus. But here's the comfort, here's the assurance, here's the honor Christ gave to this little group of believers in this house that day. Christ drew some his elect Jews to that house to hear him speak of what he had done for Lazarus and to behold what he had done for Lazarus. 
and the graciousness. I, I could just hear, I bet Lazarus and Mary and Martha were so kind to whoever it was that came into that house. And they all were speaking about Christ and telling them, listen to him. Listen to what he's saying. And our Lord drew them there and gave them faith to believe him. And they went away believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he honors his people. That's how he honors his people. Brethren, Christ has come to our town. He's come to our house. He's come to each of us that he's called personally, individually. And he's used this little group of believers right here to call out some of his lost sheep. Let us make sure that every time we gather together, we're making him a supper. We're here to sing his praises. We're here to pray to him to help us and to, to meet with us and to be the strength and power we need for everything. We want to preach him and his glory, his person, his works, and what he's doing and shall do. And, and everything about it, we want it to be honoring to him. Honoring to him. And pray it'll be continue to be for his honor, his honor alone. All right, brethren. Our Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for this beautiful example of your grace and mercy. And Lord, in the middle of this tumultuous time and this barren wilderness, we pray, Lord, you'd keep us assembling together, gathering in your honor. And Lord, we pray you'd bring all the honor to yourself in each heart, help us to have communion with you. Give us hearts to worship you and bow down to your feet. Make nothing too costly for us to sacrifice for your cause. Keep us, Lord, serving your brethren, our brethren, knowing that serving them we're serving you and Lord we pray you'd keep working this calling out your lost sheep thank you for this privilege Lord that to give us a heart to want to want to gather in your honor we pray you would indeed be the guest of honor what a privilege Lord, don't let us take it for granted. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and your righteousness. In Christ we pray. Amen.